Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is just a quick introduction video to a new series that uh, for now is going to be posted on this channel called Stocks on the Rocks. It's where we sit down, we relax, and for roughly 30 to 60 minutes each week, we're going to talk about what's going on in the stock market locally here in Australia and abroad, and we're just going to go over any pressing issues that might be going on in any given week. Um, so... Look, I did debate with myself whether I was going to put this on the channel or not. Um, I know it's really long, uh, sort of a really long format for um, for YouTube. So I'm just going to leave it up to you guys. Um, I'm going to put two comments down below. One is going to be this should stay on YouTube, and the other is going to be no. Let's just leave it on Spotify or, or Apple Podcasts or whatever it might be. So whichever of those gets the most likes wins. Period. So. Um, Either way, this will be um, uploaded every week to uh, Apple, Spotify, and all of the other places that you would normally get your podcast. Um, so yes, I do appreciate you guys um, checking out this first episode. Hopefully you can sit down with me, have a drink, enjoy it, and, and just relax. Anyway, cheers guys. I'll chat soon. Well, guys, welcome to the very first episode of Stocks on the Rocks. For those of you that aren't aware, these episodes are derived from the YouTube channel Compounding Everything. That channel is focused on helping you build and grow a long-term portfolio. Now, obviously, we do ultimately have the same goal here. However, we're more so going to focus on stock market moves, news, and need-to-know information on a weekly and monthly basis. Now, for those of you that are new here and haven't seen my YouTube channel, I'm a 32-year-old long-term investor who in a past life was also a day trader. I'm lucky enough to also be the owner of two small businesses, one of those being in the IT sector and the other being a real estate agency. And other than that, I spend most of my spare time creating YouTube videos, podcasts, and recently starting a degree in economics, which I find absolutely fascinating. Now, you may be wondering, what's the go with the title Stocks on the Rocks? And for those of you that have seen the logo attached to the channel, it would probably make sense. No, we're not going to be discussing, well, we're not solely going to be discussing stocks that are having difficult times right now, or going through a difficult time right now. Um, the whole idea is to have a casual show where we can have a couple of drinks and talk about the stock market as a whole and just, just cover everything. Um, this is not going to be a highly polished uh, A-grade podcast. The goal is really just to give you guys some information and together have a bit of fun and and uh, enjoy the stock market a little bit more by by hopefully learning a little bit and, uh, and just keeping up to date with all of the ins and outs and, and a bit of the goss. Now, being the first episode, please forgive me if I'm a little rusty. I've never recorded a podcast before. Um, so I did just kind of ease myself into this. I did decide to kick things off with uh, my most popular video on YouTube, and I'm going to bring that across, and I've edited a little bit. I've made it into a more of a, a podcast-type episode. Um, that video was covering four stocks I have on my personal watch list that I think you might be interested in adding to yours. Um, like I said in that video, I really do think that most value investors have had a pretty rough time over the last few years for the most part. The market has just seemed a little bit too expensive. And I mean, in saying that, after the last couple of months, there is no doubt as, as value type investors, we've had a few more opportunities on the table than we may have compared to six or 18 months ago. Um, in saying that, it just hasn't been optimal. I mean, I was talking to a friend about this a couple of days ago, and I was saying, imagine a world where a stock market can crash by 35%. And for the most part, except for maybe a handful of stocks, if that, you still can't find true traditional value. That w it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling when you really think about it, to think that in this day and age, with a market that had crashed 35%, there was just no value to be found in the sense of any larger companies that we all know, the names like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, a few of them were very close to potential value um, propositions, but but for the most part, nothing really came into that comfort zone when you when, in the sense of, of buying with a margin of safety, especially if you were buying for the first time. Now, it may have been a different story for those of you that were 
dollar cost averaging into a position that you may have started five or 10 years ago. Well, yes, definitely. That, that, that would have been a great opportunity to potentially average into some positions a little more that, that you may have you may have liked already. And I mean, for the most part, um, you know, uh, you've already got a little bit of a margin of safety if you entered some of these positions five or 10 years ago, especially the good ones. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a fascinating time. I don't, I don't, I don't quite know what is going to happen next. I mean, none of us ever really do. Um, there are so many chess pieces at play at the moment, and I, I just, I don't know what's going to happen in the next six to 18 months. Um, there are so many models that are predicting so many different outcomes. Um, I mean, just yesterday, we had uh, the US jobless numbers come out, and it was predict- predicted at that point in time that we might go down to 25% unemployment over there in the US, which which would be astronomical. I mean, there's no doubt about it. 25% unemployment would be near levels, and I think actually maybe meeting levels of the Great Depression, I mean, nearly 100 years ago, uh, which is just insane. Um, however, somehow, and, and the accuracy of these numbers is being disputed at the moment, somehow they managed to stay around 13.3% jobless, which still in itself is an incredible amount and not to be sneezed at. But still, I mean, you know, uh, it's large numbers. I don't know if they can really be trusted at this point in time. Some of the models they use to actually calculate these numbers can be a little bit warped. But if you use that same model, I mean, in some sense, it is still accurate as, you know, comparing it to five or 10 years ago. So 13.3%, I mean, that's, um, that's, it's still mind-boggling. It's not 25%, thankfully. Um, but it was still playing in a, in a ground where if, if we... This would have been two or three years ago. And and we had uh, 13.3% unemployment in the United States or potentially 9 to 15% unemployment in Australia here. I mean, that would be something that would crash the market by 20 or 30% in any given month at any given point in time. And yes, obviously we had that crash and now it's recovered. But what I am surprised at is that in all... Uh, in all appearances, it looks like it is going to be a V-shaped recovery, at least in the short term. I mean, we may get Ws, we may get a V that, that ends up turning into a, a you know a bit of an L um, or just flatlining. Uh, but by the looks of it, it just doesn't seem like that's going to be the case right now. And in my experience, and, and I'm sure you guys would see this as well, the when you have recoveries this strong, like we saw in 2019, and although that wasn't as large as this, when you have recoveries that strong, Generally speaking, the marketplace remains confidence um, for quite a while. Um, you know, it's it's not something that tends to just disappear overnight. When you think about it, I mean, there are a lot of calluses now on the on the market movers from the last three months. I mean, it's going to take a lot of news for these guys to 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 want to sell off in any significant way. Um, for me, what I think might be what what I think might cause that is potentially um, just consistently um, poor numbers moving forward. I mean, maybe we have a jobless amount that keeps slowly growing up, which might cause one to 5% sell-offs on, on days like that. I mean, maybe we have poor figures coming through from annual reports and and that in itself might actually um, cause, obviously, the market to decline slowly. But when we're talking a drop like we saw in March when everyone was panicking about what would happen, and rightly so, um, I mean, that's I just don't see that happening unless something absolutely hits the fan. I mean, we're going to need to see some ridiculous tariff put in place or an actual trade war. Um, we're going to need to see unemployment drop to just crazy levels for a sustained period of time. We, a month or two just isn't going to cut it anymore. This is going to have to be something that, that lasts for six to 12 months in order for the market to truly react to it, in my opinion. I mean, and that's just two things. We were just talking about current events here when you're talking about a trade war, which the market already kind of had taken into account in its own right. Now, obviously, it hadn't taken into account a full-blown trade war where there might be ridiculous tariffs. But but at this point in time, I mean, it, it's, it seems to have taken into account most of the variables there that are most likely going to happen. So, I mean, that really doesn't seem to be on the table short term. I mean, when you're looking at unemployment, yes, I guess a big spike. I mean... I don't see a three to five percent spike in unemployment from this point forward doing anything drastically in the market. I mean, the economy seems to be in some ways slightly detached from the market at this point in time. Um, so I just I don't see it. I, I don't know. I, I don't see it happening in the next uh, six or so months. Now, obviously, none of us know what's going to happen. Um, I don't even like guessing what's going to happen, but I don't see it going. 
horribly wrong unless something were to happen that we just haven't seen. And I mean, like I said, there are so many calluses there that that event would have to be so significant that people would just rock to their core. Um, and even that we've seen twice now in two years, dramatic sell-offs that recovered so, so quickly. So, I mean, you know, it's it's a fascinating market to watch. It's slightly frustrating. I'm not, I'm not, it's not even slightly frustrating. It's extremely frustrating as a long-term investor to be sitting here, um, you know, and, and myself as a previous day trader, um, you look at this and you go, man, there are some great opportunities floating around right now. Um, and I don't blame people for having a crack at some of those. I personally haven't been because it just doesn't fit my model anymore. I, I don't enjoy that risk factor. I mean, there might be a day that in the future that I will, but right now I just, with my portfolio, I'm happy with it doing what it's doing. I don't need to risk, you know, a, a large amounts of that portfolio to make, you know, a quick 50, 100 or 200% trade. That'd be amazing. But but the risk is just, the, the risk right now is just so high. And even though I've said I don't see anything happening, it doesn't mean it won't. I mean, this market could go up 25% in the next month or two, or this market could definitely go down another 25% in the next month or two. I, I, I just don't know. I think everybody's sitting in the same position. You can watch shows like Mad Money or, 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 or you know, any major news production on CNBC, and no one really seems to know what's going on. And I guess people can argue they never really do. I mean, you got to remember, a lot of these guys have been in this industry for... 30 or 40 years and and yes they're not perfect but they 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 do know what they're talking about i mean they've seen these markets move over the years however i think it's in these situations i think there are a lot of factors that are just playing in that no one can predict um i also think that the digital the world of digital investing when you've got things like robin hood and we all joke about robin hood but robin hood turns over so much volume every single day. I mean, they are literally making up for a certain percentage of all trades in America right now. And and that that helps with with these types of situations but also hinders them. I mean, that's the reason, you know, our digital uh, the, the the method of investing via digital brokerages, which is essentially all you can do right now for the most part. I mean, there are some that allow you to still call and and, and, and place trades other ways, but I would guess that 95% or more of the, of the world's traders, investors, doesn't matter, are all investing via a, an online brokerage. And I mean, you have instant access to buy and sell. And yes, that has been around for a while. It has never been adapted like it is right now. We have millions of people in forums online Young people that that haven't experienced the market for more than a year or two that left the Bitcoin world and think that this is now their new home. And quite frankly, in the Bitcoin world, they didn't know what they were talking about. And here, they probably don't know what they're talking about, but they still have a say with the amount of leveraged volume that they are using. It is just mind boggling. So, I mean, there are so many factors at play here that contribute to, to what is going on in the, in the marketplace. And and I think that, that they're all factors that need to be taken into account at the moment, which is why there's just so much uncertainty. Anyway, I digressed for 10 minutes, but that's what this podcast is going to be all about. I mean, we're going to talk about things and we're just going to rant a little bit and, and it's it's more casual. So let's go back a bit, to, sort of, let's go back towards the 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 video that I, I'm also have planned, which is talking about four stocks that that I have on my watch list right now that I think there might be some value in. Now, I, I don't think that it is the time to buy them. Now, obviously, I can't give you advice. I'm not a financial advisor, but I'm not buying these stocks right now. But I do think that that there is some value there, potentially, if the price can be right. And, and I think that they are somewhat fundamentally solid. Um, so in saying that these four stocks I do find to be interesting enough to share with you guys. I currently don't own any of these securities. Nonetheless, over the next six months, I'll be watching a couple of them pretty carefully to see if I can sort of find that entry that might suit me. And it would be fair to you to ask, well, why six months? I mean, if you're a value investor, I mean, why wait six months? It doesn't make sense. So you're trying to time the market. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to time the market. But I guess, like I said for the last sort of ten minutes, that there's so much uncertainty surrounding the general marketplace at the moment due to the pandemic and macroeconomic sort of effects going on around the world that 
I'm just not comfortable in buying a, an individual security right now without knowing, I guess, what is, is going to happen over the next sort of six to 12 months. So I am watching these companies very closely. I do think they're fundamentally sound right now. It doesn't mean it can't change. And I am hopefully going to gain an entry into these companies over the next six to 12 months. Once again, not advice, just my personal opinion on what I plan on doing. So, I mean, the goal with every long-term investment you make is to find that margin of safety, buying through, hopefully, at what is, is sort of a, a, a discount to intrinsic value uh, or what you believe the future value of that company will be. In saying that, some of these companies are or, or will be directly impacted by the pandemic and, and the macroeconomic ripple effect that is still yet to come, um, which, like I said, none of us know what it is. Um, we could... Uh, any of those things could change their fundamental position, um, although I think for most of them it's unlikely. It's definitely possible still at this point in time. Um, so in saying that, let's get started. I'm going to kick things off with one from the, I guess you could say the left field, which is Australia's largest collections agency, Credit Corp Group. Um, their ticker code on the ASX is CCP. Now, Credit Corp Group, up until February, were one of the largest 50 companies listed on the ASX. Um, for those of you that may not have heard of them before, these are these guys are a thoroughbred long-term performer, producing a consistently growing revenue stream for well over a decade now, a fantastic return on equity, and reasonably well-managed debt, all things considered. Um, now, that is all surrounded by a solid management team and a very much a proven track record. However, as you can imagine, in times of hardship or recessions, collections agencies have a very difficult time. In the GFC, Credit Corp share price went from $12, uh, well, just over $12 actually, to just under 50 cents in a matter of 12 months. And before I carry on here, although that sounds horrible, those courageous enough to buy this security in 2009 at the bottom of that dip and hold it for the last 11 years would have res would have achieved a return of 7,100% um, and dividend income. I mean, think about that. You had 71 times your money and dividend income, which isn't, it, they didn't have the best dividend, but it's it's a dividend nonetheless, which is incredible. Um, I mean, you know, that's it's, it's it's one of those stories on the ASX that's actually almost unheard of when it comes to a company that was was already a very solid performer before the GFC um, and since has obviously just dominated. I mean, there are a handful of other collection agencies on the list on the ASX. There were more in the past. Um, and all of them have a hard time with so many factors. I mean, uh, Collection House, who have been um, listed for a long time now, they've been frozen. The, 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 the security has been suspended for the last, I don't know, four months. I think it's been four months before the market crash and coincidentally... And they've been suspended six uh, since trying to figure out what they're going to do with their valuations of, of their books because they made a mistake. They're obviously, I assume, they've made a mistake because they can't open that, that stock up again at the moment. And I mean, you know, um, this is a difficult industry. However, Credit Corp, uh, I don't mean to go on about them, but I think it's important to, to sort of get the message across that Credit Corp have done an incredible job um, in their industry over the last 10 to 15 years it's 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 unprecedented literally in australia um and they've made some great acquisitions as well um so i mean they're doing all sorts of great things um but like i said i mean that uh 50 cent investment you would have made would have turned into 36 dollars plus dividends over that 11 year period which is just insane um, now, most like most listed companies, I mean, they dropped from that thirty-six dollars to six dollars in a couple of weeks. Um, in the crash, just gone. Um, however, like almost every other company listed at the moment, they have recovered for the most part. They're nowhere near where they were, but but I think yesterday they were trading at around eighteen dollars per share. So, I mean, if you were courageous enough, and I regret deeply not buying it at six dollars. However, my my, I shouldn't say I regret it because my fundamentals and in, in what can happen to them throughout a recession showed me that they could get to a price a bit lower than that. And when I say a bit, I, I estimated quite a bit lower. Um, so when I got to $6 and I was sitting there on the buy button, ready to make my first investment in this company, um, my math just wasn't 
um, adding up to, to something that was making me comfortable. So I, I left that trade on the sidelines and um, now they're trading at 19 or $18 per share. Um, so obviously those courageous enough would have had a 300, oh, you know, it, it would have made three times that money. Um, however, I don't, I guess, wholly regret that because still at this point in time, the reason I'm not buying them at $18 is because it, it, the same reason I had at $6 is I think there could be hardship to come there. I mean, right now, um, from what I've heard, they are doing incredibly well with people um, that have received payouts from their super, the $10,000 super payment, and people that are receiving job keeper or job seeker payments. Um, you have to remember a lot of the clientele, not all, but a, a large portion of the clientele uh, in, in collections agencies tend to be people that make repayments. Um, and they're normally not the best repayments. They can be five, ten, fifty dollars a week on on, and sometimes just covering interest. Um, a lot of the time they do cover some of the capital as well, but but there are times where it's just covering interest alone. And in situations like these, um, those people are motivated by Credit Corp and other collections agencies to pay out their accounts in the sense of a settlement. So let's say they own they owe $5,000 um, and they've paid off 2000 of that and then the balance is now $3,000. Um, Credit Corp know that there have been all of these incentives to help the economy keep moving forward over the next two months, over the last two months, sorry. And what they will do is they will take uh, that, that information they've got, whether it be $10,000 pulled out of super or whether it be these people, they know these people are on job seeker, for example, and they, those payments were doubled um, from 550 odd a fortnight to 1100 a fortnight. Well, they will go to these customers that they have on their records, knowing that they're in these hardship positions already. And they will say, look, we know that you're potentially getting additional income right now. So we can offer you a discounted settlement amount. And what they do is they will go, if you can pay us $1,500 today, we'll close this account. It's done. No $3,000, $1,500, account's closed, walk away. And some people will take them up on this offer if they're, if they're, if they're savvy about it, about their, their debts, because this is a really solid opportunity for people to get out of debt at a low cost. Um, and... And the great thing is, is that Credit Corp are still making money most of the time. Um, they're buying debt for cents on the dollar a lot of the time when it comes to to, to buying large uh, amounts of debt that they will buy from either the big banks or smaller companies or telcos or whatever it might be. Um, a lot of it is credit card debt. A lot of it is bad personal loans that weren't secured. Or some were secured and still have balances left after the security was sold. But it, 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 most of the time you find that, that these are... Uh, these are debts that have gone reasonably bad, not always, and they the the the, the chance of that bank or original um, facilitator of that loan collecting on them is is really quite slim, and they decide to sell it off for cents on the dollar, and and I imagine those those facilitators uh, or those lenders can can claim tax deductions for the loss and can probably um, claim uh, various other things as well there. So they still come out, not on top, but they still come out in a reasonable position. Credit Corp then gets those debts for however many cents on the dollar, and then they have to account in the running costs of the company in, in that margin, um, whether it be wages, office costs, you know, acquisition cost of more debt and other businesses, um, all sorts of things like that. And then they have to figure out, okay, are we making a good enough return on our equity or return on the invested capital in this debt um, to 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 make it worth it um, for us? And a lot of the time that answer is yes, um, and they they will make good money. So even selling a getting a debt paid back for fifteen hundred dollars, um, if it was if it was three thousand dollars left, I mean they probably potentially may have paid ten, twenty, or thirty cents on the dollar for that. So although that fifteen hundred dollars is fifty percent of the dollar, if you were breaking it down, um, they may have only paid you know twenty or thirty percent. And a lot of the time, it's worth them clearing that debt off their books. Anyway, like I said, short term, it seems like these guys are probably going to do quite well with that with that type of mentality because people are just going to get rid of debts that they can afford to get rid of because it just saves them that little bit every month that they don't have to pay anymore once the debt's paid off. Um, and in times like this, that is a smart thing to do. Now, obviously, you could have the same argument saying that these people aren't always necessarily the, the smartest or savviest um, with their personal finances because they got in this position already. But I can assure you that that having worked in this industry myself, often that's not actually the case. Um, a lot of these people just 
neglected the debt um, and they are in a position where they can normally pay them back. I mean, now there is a large percentage that, that aren't in that situation, but there is a just as just a larger percentage, in my opinion, that, that are. They, they often can afford to pay these debts back over time or sometimes even lump sums. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's short term, I think, with people pulling out 10 grand from their super that are in hardship and people that have... Um, People that have doubled, um, you know, uh, doll payments or welfare payments, and people that have a JobKeeper payment coming in, where they may have actually been making more now from JobKeeper than they were from their jobs. Um, I think you're probably going to have Credit Corp making more money than they were before this. However, the risk comes in 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 the six to eighteen month range from now, in my opinion if we were to experience an economic recession. Now, the treasurer has come out, the Australian treasurer has come out and said, look, we are in recession. And and he kind of called it early, technically speaking. Um, I mean, actually, that's that's not true. Technically speaking, he called it correctly. However, he probably could have milked this one out a bit longer because we weren't, our GDP wasn't actually down as much as people anticipated it to be down um, last quarter or, or last month, I should say. So, uh, at this point in time, um, we're in a technical recession. Now, that means a lot of things um, for the economy, but it means a lot for Credit Corp as well. If you break down this this business model, you completely oversimplify this business model that they have. What they have to worry about is simple. They've got X amount of debt on their books, and they have to make sure that that can be maintained as well as their cost of operation, and hopefully, even in hard times, hopefully a little bit of profit um, to, to, to add on the top there to keep them just floating through these difficult times. Now, for the most part, um, collections agencies in recessions, like I said, get hit very hard. Um, and I think it's mainly just because they 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 are going to be the first people where, where you've got a bad debt. You might have a hundred dollar a week repayment on a bad debt. You've already been defaulted for it. Maybe you've already had a summons against you in the sense of a judgment. And they've said, look, you know, you need to pay us this. The, the consequences of not paying that after that point for people that don't have assets, for people that might be in the lower sort of socioeconomic um, areas, I don't mean to stumble on my words, but they're, I'm trying to word it in a way that isn't offensive to anyone. Essentially, if they've got no assets, Credit Corp can do almost nothing um, short term to these people. Now, long term, they've got a lot of options, but short term, when you're talking one to six months or one to 12 months, these things take a long time to go back through the system. And and these people can stop paying their $100, and if they've already been defaulted or already had a judgment put against them, the options for Credit Corp become a lot more in-depth and there's a lot more movement that is, is required to be taken behind the scenes to try and collect that money. And if it's a small debt, it's just not going to happen. They're not going to chase people down for one to five grand through the courts in most cases. Um, they're just going to let that sit there. And I think in, in these situations, a lot of this debt comes from telco bills and, and other random things like that that are that are sometimes smaller. They've got a lot of big debt on their book as well, but a lot of it is smaller debt that is more that, that I guess is more um, achievable in the sense of repayments. So when you get to times like this in, in recessions, you're going to have to worry about people that go, no, I'm not paying you the $100 a week or a month anymore. Um, and then how many of those people on their on their books actually do that as well? Um, that would be the big concern, I think. Um, and that's why the share price went from $36 to $6 in a matter of three weeks because, I mean, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a massive risk. So you're probably thinking, um, why would I want to, why, why would I want to put a company like that on my watch list? You know, why, why would I do that to myself? Um, and I guess, um, the simple answer is no. I mean, I don't want to lose money, but I do want to, uh, reiterate that these guys are a long-term performer and yes, there is a chance that that they could go broke in, in the next 24 months. It's highly unlikely. I mean, this is a blue chip stock. They've got investors that are willing to pound money into them to keep them afloat. And yeah, it might not be healthy for their book short term, but, but it, it will keep them afloat. And second of all, they've got no competition in, in the sense of any company that's that's on their heels in Australia, even close to them. They are, they're not just head and shoulders above. They're ankles, knees, hips, 
and head and shoulders above their competition in Australia. Uh, there's just no one even close. I mean, so one of my reasons for, for considering these guys is that, first of all, they are the biggest and best in their field. Like I said, they've come back from a recession before. That means they aren't kind of sitting around the table drawing a game plan from scratch on what to do here. They've already kind of got it. And not to mention that they have an incredible moat. And not a moat in the sense of nobody can come and take that business. It's a, it's a moat in the sense of it's almost impossible to somebody to come into this country short term, you know, zero to, to 36 months and take their market share in any significant way. Um, you know, and and I just don't see that happening at all. I mean, Credit Corp is actually expanding to other countries to take market shares. People don't, you know, it's not a, a huge issue for them where they're going to have to worry about people biting at their, their, their profit margins too much short term, in my opinion, anyway. The second point would be is that they can manage their debt and have a decent amount of cash on the sidelines at the moment. Now, of course, that amount isn't endless by any means. However, one of the benefits in running a very profitable company that grows earnings per share and revenue year on year is that you're generally speaking going to be in a better position when reaching these types of situations. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, their books are pretty clean and that's going to bring more than just their cash onto the table when they hit hard times. It's going to show investors that, yeah, we're in hard times now, but you know that we can do this when we're not. I mean, you know that, that we can make you money when times are good. And, and let's be frank, any company any company that that loses a majority of its income is going to be in the same position short term. That doesn't mean it's not a company long term that that isn't worth their weight. Um, and then my final point, which is when all of this is over, their service model will still be very much essential. I mean, although they hit the hardest in recessions, they make the most coming out of them. And you might ask why. And it's simply because these guys purchase a, a huge amount of debt from some of the biggest players in Australia. And debt is a profitable game long term if run by an organization that absolutely knows what they're doing. And I wholeheartedly believe that Credit Corp fits that criteria. I mean, their results are uh, 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 outstanding from the last 10 years, considering that they are in a, a country that that is relatively small in comparison to someone like the United States or the UK. I mean, we only have 24, 25 million people in this country and, and they have managed to expand into other nations and make profit there as well. They've done some incredible things like opening up different call centers in different parts of the world, which returns a greater profit for investors as well. Um, I mean, these things, their growth is just is, is unbelievable. Um, so, I mean, like I said, they, they've done it before. Um, I don't own shares in this company right now. I've never actually owned shares in Credit Corp. Um, I thought I'd leave this for the end because I, I, I didn't want this to be a biased opinion. Um, so, I left it for the end of my sort of analysis on Credit Corp. But they, I actually worked for Credit Corp. Um, 10 years ago, before I started my businesses, um, or before I started my first business, I should say, um, I... Uh, I worked for Credit Corp for about 18 months, give or take. I think it was about 18 months. Um, at that point in time, I think they had about 600 or 700 staff um, all in all, in all of their Australian offices uh, together. Um, I worked in Brisbane, in the Brisbane office. Um, and although it wasn't a job for me, um, the company just has a structure like none that I've ever worked at before. I mean, these guys just know what they're doing. And, and what I really like to see is that some of the people I worked with 10 years ago, I mean, and these people were all my age. We were only 23, 24, 20, you know, early 20s back then. Um, they're all in prominent positions in that company now, um, you know, and they're all doing very well. And and that's a, a good thing to see a company taking staff that have been there for 10 years. I mean, how many 22-year-olds do you know that have been in the same job for 10 years, especially when it comes to a job where you're going in at an entry-level wage, you're going in uh, essentially being a, 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 a shit kicker, mind the language. I mean, you know, you, you, you are not highly valued, um, you know, because you're in that entry-level role. It's the same in every big company. And these guys grinded their way through. The company respected that, and they put them in positions where they they can harness their experience of being there for over a decade, which is, which in my eyes is a great thing to see in a company. I mean, you know, it's it it doesn't create that toxic culture of positions being open, but being passed to an external applicant um, when you've got a good internal applicant already there looking at you in the face with experience in the company, um, understanding the culture, understanding how things work. So I mean, I I personally think that is second to none. 
I will always hire myself internally when given the opportunity um, because that's that it just makes sense. These people know your culture. They, they're part of the family. They get it, um, you know, and and that's one big tick I'll give to Credit Corp. Now, like I said earlier, it, um, is that this is really just a, a, a sort of a, a, a basic analysis on Credit Corp. Um, if you guys are interested in me going into Credit Corp in a bit more depth, and I know we sort of spoke about them a little bit here, but there is so much to talk about when it comes to this company. Um the more and more I talk about them, the more I like what they're doing and I like them long term. The, the, the problem is, is that I just can't buy them at a margin of safety right now. And I, I'm not going to purchase a company when I can't get in at some form of safety. It doesn't mean I have to buy at a discount to value necessarily. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways to calculate that value. Um if you're talking traditionally buying at a discount to what their their actual intrinsic value is, then then that's going to be very difficult. I mean, unless we see some massive crash, um, you know, bigger than what we saw in March. Um, but but when you're talking, when I'm talking about trying to buy in with a bit of a margin of safety here, I guess what I'm looking for is a margin of safety over 20 or 30 years, um, because that's how long I'd want to hold this company. All things, you know all things working in my favor. So anyway, um, you know, that's Credit Corp. I, I, I love the company. I'm not buying them right now. I wouldn't recommend that anyone does or doesn't buy them right now because I'm not a financial advisor, but but it's definitely food for thought. And it might be something you want to work in, uh, look into a bit more. So like I said, their, their ticket code is CCP. They're listed on the ASX. Um, it might be worth checking them out. Anyway, that brings us to number two and three on this list of four stocks that I have on my watch list. Um, they're both REITs in the commercial space um, and hold very minimal exposure short term to the current pandemic. The first is National Storage and the second is Viva Energy REIT. Now, National Storage owns approximately 125 self-storage centers covering Australia and New Zealand. Within those centers, National Storage manages roughly uh, sorry, 50,000 clients over 77,000 individual storage units. Um, from memory, they're sitting at about 88, I think it was 88, so 82 or 88 percent um, occupancy uh, at last report, um, which is great. I mean, you know, you, those numbers are pretty good. Um it also leaves some room for some some growth there, and Viva Energy REIT, um, their portfolio includes 454 freehold service stations located in all states and territories in Australia. Now it is worth noting with these guys that since I have recorded my my previous YouTube video, which is a few weeks ago, um, they actually changed the name of this REIT. It's no longer called Viva Energy REIT. It's called Waypoint REIT. Um, now it's the exact same. REIT uh, or company doing the exact same thing. However, they just changed the name for whatever reason. Now, like I said, Waypoint holds 454 freehold service stations all lo located throughout Australia in all states and territories. Um, now, all of these properties are actually leased to Viva Energy, which is also listed on the ASX. So I guess, first of all, before I go any more into Viva Energy, let's first discuss why I like National Storage, the company, and and then I'll come back to Viva and we can go into them a little bit more, sort of in a little bit more depth. Now, when it comes to National Storage, what I love about these guys is that they're providing a great return on equity and earnings per share and revenue growth consistently. Um, but what I really like is that although there's competition, and I wouldn't say they have a great moat necessarily, although you could argue they do, they don't really have to worry about competition too much. Um, I mean, the thing is, is that with a growing population in Australia, I don't think it's overly important for them to be the only player. Um, what's important is that their individual storage centers maintain a profit margin and at least maintain the equity that's been provided to the REIT itself. And I don't see that changing too much. I mean, storage facilities are just storage facilities. It's pretty simple, right? People use them. And uh, especially in times of hardship, they may be used even more. People are having to move back home. They've got too much furniture. People having to sell houses and downsize, all sorts of things like that. So I, I do like national storage mainly because of their fundamentals, but because it just, it's, it's a feel good type company in the sense that it's easy to understand. It's not outside my circle of competence. Um, now, they're also sort of trading with a reasonable amount of debt, um, all things considered. I mean, they have to have debt because they're buying storage facilities and acquiring storage facilities. So obviously, you've got land and building costs there that have to be taken into account. Um, however, they are, well, 
they were at time of recording this sitting under book value. However, they've been creeping up. Um, the share price has been creeping up a bit over the last couple of days. So that might not be quite under book value, but certainly around book value right now and definitely under net tangible asset value. Um, so the fundamentals are definitely there, like I said. So I mean, when we take a look at the product itself, it's it's almost has no exposure to the current pandemic in a negative sense. I believe that any clients that would be that would be exiting over the short term would probably at least, at the very least, be, re- be replaced with new clients. Um, however, and this is just a guess, it's pure speculation, I don't know, I think that they will actually see their client numbers go up. I think that that occupancy rate will go from 82 to 88% up to sort of 90 plus percent in my opinion, just because you're going to see people that can't afford to be living where they're living in times like this. You know, the people that didn't budget well, the people that that, that unfortunately had hardship land uh, on on their doorstep, um, you know, that may be over leveraged their position in, in their property, they're going to have to do something about it. And a lot of the time that means excess furniture and you can do two things. You can sell it or if you want to keep it, you have to store it. Um, so, I mean, well-run storage facilities like these are generally speaking outstanding performers over the long run. I mean, in fact, prior to the pandemic, there was talk of a takeover bid coming out of the coming out of the U.S. for 1.9 billion dollars from memory, which is a significant increase on the market, the current market cap of 1.1 billion dollars. However, since that time, the bid appears to have fallen through, and I mean that was to be expected in times like this. No one's going to be going around spending all their capital when everything's just falling through the floor. So, I mean, although I would prefer there not to be a takeover bid if I were to buy this company in the next six to 12 to 18 months or more because because they are producing good owner owner earnings. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see it. Um, Like I said, I'm very excited to watch National Storage read over the next few months. I do wish I took a stake when the share price hit lows of 120. I believe that would have accounted for somewhat of a margin of safety, um, all things considered. However, it wasn't meant to be and I didn't. Um, So anyway, that takes us on to the Viva Energy REIT. Um, this fund is very simple, um, in my opinion. Now, remember, the Viva Energy REIT is now called the Waypoint REIT. However, it's the exact same thing. Um, I believe it's probably one of the greatest hidden gems on the ASX if you're looking for sort of constant income. This is not going to be your cup of tea if you're looking for rapid gains for the sense of capital growth. Um, they will get capital growth most likely, but it's 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 not what this fund is about. Um, income is is very much a big part of this fund and I believe is somewhat protected from COVID-19. Now, it is worth mentioning that all of these freeholds, which are service stations, are leased to Beaver Energy, the company. Now, the only risk here, which is a very small risk in my opinion, have with oil doing what it's doing and, and, and Australia in general being how Australia is right now, there is a risk there that some of those repayments might be lowered or not met, which would put this fund in a difficult position. So it is something to remember. However, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people that manage funds for clients and they're looking at this fund very closely. In fact, they've already purchased, they were buying into it when it was down at its lows in March. Um, now, that doesn't mean you should or I should. That doesn't mean anything, essentially. It's just worth saying that I think that the, the risk is low. However, it's still definitely there. Um, so it might be one to bring up with your planner and see if that risk profile fits into your portfolio. Um, for me, like I've said in many of my, my YouTube videos on Compound and everything, um, I have 5% of my portfolio that's dedicated to somewhat medium to high probability, but high risk sort of plays. And this type of security would definitely fit in there if I was looking for income. However, I'm not looking for income right now by the sense of a dividend or a distribution. Um, you know, so that's why I haven't purchased this fund. But it does, um, you know, it is it is currently sitting down 20% from its 2019 share price. Um, it's, it was producing, at least when I looked these numbers up uh, a few hours ago, it was producing 5.5% dividend um, income, which is a dividend, in fact, that has been growing year on year for a little while now. Although I, I don't, I don't think it would be uh, super surprising to see that dividend lowered a little. I don't think it's going to go. I don't think it would be 50% or anything like that. I think you might see a 10 or 20% drop in that dividend over the next 12 months. But when you're talking a 10 or 20% drop from 5.5%, if you happen to buy in at those levels, um, you know, you, you, you're you really going to still be on a median sort of par with what the market's paying out anyway at, most, at any point in time over the next 12 months because dividends are lower in general. So like I mentioned, um, this fund is, is very simple. All it's doing is, leasing um, service station freeholds to to Viva Energy, the company. And as long as the lease is paid, the fund is ultimately happy. Um, as one of the great dividend performers in Australia right now, it definitely might be worth putting some research 
into if you are looking for income. Now, this last one is definitely going to ruffle some feathers, and it certainly did on my video on YouTube as well. Um, there were a lot of pros and cons, which is very, very true. I am not debating that at all. However, the company I'm talking about, I do consider a speculative play. It would fit into that 5% part of my portfolio. This definitely wouldn't be a, a 10 or 15% buy where I was I was dollar cost averaging in over the next you know two, three, four years at this current situation anyway with what's going on. Um, however, the company I'm talking about is Flight Center. So I don't want to get too caught up in the fundamentals here because I don't think that their fundamentals are completely accurate moving forward short term, long term. I don't think they'll change too much at all. I mean, when I say long term, I mean sort of two to, to five years. Um, we can debate all day about if this company is actually going to exist in 15 or 20 years in their current form. And I'd probably agree with you that they probably won't exist in the sense of being a, a physical retail store. However, when I'm trying to explain to people why I like Flight Center, it's because it's, it's not an opinion. Um, the the simple fact of the matter at the moment is that Flight Center have a significant market share um, of, of of all travel agencies in Australia. And I mean significant, it's significant. It's it's well over 50% market share when you're talking to just local companies that sell here. If you include international ones, it's, it's not as high. But, but when you're talking about local sales here, they have a huge market share of, of the whole um, total transaction value of all travel in Australia. But... Not only that, they have almost all of the retail exposure. And I think we all know somebody, right, that isn't comfortable buying online. Um, now, that doesn't mean that's going to be the case in 10 or 20 years. It's, I'm, on, I'm on board. I, I'm in IT. You know, they, Like I said to you guys, I work in the industry. It's the future. There's no fighting it. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to do it soon. Um, but right now, zero to five years from now, uh, people will be doing it still. People want to get their cruises. They want to get their holiday packages. They want to go sit in front of somebody. They want to feel comfortable. They want to know they're insured. There's so many things there. And yes, you and I can all go, man, you can just do all that stuff online. It's the same thing. But people don't see it that way. Um, you know, there is a certain demographic here. With all due respect, the demographic lies between about 45 and 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 80. Um that is the demographic that is going into these stores and using them. Now, there are some younger ones. I mean, because obviously they've got the, the sectors like student flights. Now, they're not 45-year-olds, and they're going in there because they may be inexperienced, or they may think it, and, oh, it's not just they may think it's a good deal. It They can be great deals for students via student flight centers. Um, now... They've, I think that I think from memory there's a student flights website as well but but a lot of these people might still be going into store because that's where the deals are you know like it, it makes sense so at this point in time I think that short term in my eyes short term is not what day traders would call short term of a few days or a week or a month short term for me is zero to five years and I think in zero to five years these guys are going to dominate they, they're going to keep dominating now after that I don't know I, I think there is there are so many arguments that could be made there and I'd probably agree with people that were saying look this has to be declining I mean we could have said this 10 years ago right we could have said 10 years ago, look, this is not, this is declining. You know, people aren't going to be going into to do a local shopping center and 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 buying a, a, a flight or a cruise at a counter. They're going to go online. It makes so much sense. It's cheaper. You can you can price hunt. You can do, it's just better. But they are, they're still there. They're still going in. Uh, over 54% of flight center's income came from retail sales. Just think about that for a second. The other 40 something percent, there's there's two sectors left there. And one of them is their corporate travel sector, which is making more itself than competitors like Webjet make as a whole. But you've got a retail section of Flight Center that is making more than double what flight what Webjet does as a whole just from their stores. And from their retail sales, I mean it's 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 a it, the, the numbers, the proof's in the pudding right now. Uh, and and yes. I would not buy these guys for a 15-year hold or a 10-year hold or even a 20 or 30-year hold right now in their current form because I'm waiting for them uh, to truly innovate when it comes to their online platform. I mean, you look at Booking.com um, or Trivago.com, which are obviously two big American sites. Their, their platforms, especially Booking.com, their platforms are just seconds and none. They make it so easy. I use Booking.com all the time, um, you know, because it just makes sense. Um, you know, you go on there, you can compare all the options, you can figure it out, you get your rewards points. It just makes sense. I've never booked anything on FlightCenter.com that I do in my life. Um, doesn't mean I don't like Flight Center. I love the company. I just finished talking about them for the last, you know, 10 minutes. But 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 at this point in time, I, I, I don't understand why these companies 
can't build a good website and and make it simple for people to use. They seem to cram too much on there. They, they, they're trying to expose too much to, to people at once. And I personally think that they need to, to simplify their platforms like Booking.com have done, and it will just dominate. I mean, Australia is just waiting for somebody to come and take that market share when it comes to online sales, you know, online travel agency type sales. It's it's an open playing field, and I I don't know the actual figures. I should look this up, and I'll let you guys know in another episode. But I'd be amazed to see how much Booking dot com uh, take from Australia. It'd be a huge amount. So many of us would be using Booking dot com and sites like that to book local hotels. I go on Booking dot com to book a hotel when I'm staying in Brisbane City or at the Gold Coast or in Sydney. You know, I I don't go on Flight Center or 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 webjet or anything like that i mean i just don't like it's 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 they're not the cheapest normally it's a clunky side to use it's it's difficult and these are difficult things to do it, it's not hard for a billion dollar company to build a great website anyway i'm ranting a little bit there but it does frustrate me because i think if, if they could nail that i mean they would dominate why wouldn't they they've got the name everyone knows who they are and and they've got the market share just convert that market share to online. I mean, and and I'm sitting here. I'm, if they're bored with to listen to this, they'll probably be like, oh, what do you think we're trying to do? I get it. I know you're probably trying to do it, but but you're not doing a good job at it. I mean, it's the website is clunky and and it's it's uh, it's a bit disappointing as a potential shareholder, someone that wants to buy your stock. But I I can't do it right now because I'm I'm not I'm not liking the company ten years from now. Um, I don't like, you know, so much innovation is required. I, I actually believe there's a place for retail stores in 15 years, but you need to innovate. There, there needs to be innovation in those stores to make them modern and to make them something that people will use because there will be retail centers in 15 years. That you, There will still be shopping malls in 15 years. We, we all thought 10 years ago this was not going to be existent because of Amazon and eBay. And it was it was kind of fair. We all get in this futuristic mindset. We think, oh, you know, this is, this is probably going to happen, right? But people... We've learned that humans like to human. I mean, they like to go to the shopping malls. They like to, to try on things. They like to walk around. They like to meet up. It's a place of gathering. It's not just a place of shopping. And at this point in time, I think the companies that can capitalize on providing that modern futuristic type offering to their clients inside of a retail center are the ones that are going to dominate because they just have to pair that with a great online offering and you've got it. You've got the market. You, you will take the market share. It, that proof is in the pudding when it comes to companies in America that have done this so well and spread rapidly. You've got people like Spotify, uh, Uber, Amazon. Their platforms work. It's simple. You just experience it. You go on there, you like it, you keep using it. I mean, I'm looking at Spotify on my computer right now and and I use it all the time. Why? Because I, it's just easy. Now, I know there are other people like Apple Play or whatever the Apple platform's called and, and all those guys that offer solutions like this. But I, I got onto Spotify first. I love them. It remembers all my stuff. I've got like five or six years worth of yearly playlists. It's there. It's simple. It works. So... You need to create that experience, in my opinion, with, with your customers. If it, and that's the only way that Flight Center could dominate this field moving forward, in my opinion. Anyway, before the pandemic, this company was a true thoroughbred performer. I mean, listen to these figures for a second. A five-year average of 18.5% return on equity, year-on-year -year revenue growth for the last seven years, $1.3 billion available to them in short-term cash and loans, and a positive, a positive sorry, earnings per share for over the last decade. Now, of course... 2020 had other plans for them. I mean, like I said, I'm not buying them at this stage. However, if the right price did become available, that could take into account a near 70 to 90% decline in revenue for 12 to 18 months, along with a potential loss of their net fixed asset base being taken into account as well, then I think they could become attractive as a short-term speculative play. Um, and for those that have come across from Compound and everything, it's probably odd to hear me say that because I, I always say, look, speculation is is the devil when it comes to your long-term portfolio. Um, but like I said, 5% of my portfolio is for pure speculation. Um, I enjoy it. It's something I like to do. Um, yes, it's counterproductive um, to a long-term portfolio, but but I believe that that we have to we have to be enjoying what we do, and and I like to challenge myself to find companies that I think are attractive as a fundamental investment, but also might be a little bit speculative as well um, for a swing trade. Now, yes, that does go against everything I'd normally say, like I said, but after all, Buffett does say don't buy a stock unless you're willing to hold it hold it forever, but. What Mr. Buffett forgot to mention is that he actually had a taste for the odd speculative play, speculative play himself as a younger chap. And personally, like I said, I've got the means in my portfolio to to do this. And 
if the opportunity were to present itself, I probably would. However, it didn't get close in the last sell-off in May. It didn't even get anywhere near where I believe it would take into account those those discounts. Um, nowhere near it. So it doesn't look like I'm going to get that opportunity. It doesn't bother me. I don't really care if I don't. Um, but it is interesting nonetheless to consider. Anyway... To end off this podcast, which, by the way, is has gone for 54 minutes so far. This was a 15-minute podcast for my first one that I had planned. So, yeah, I've probably gone over a little bit. But, I mean, that's the, that's the name of this is Stocks on the Rocks. I mean, you know, it's bound, you're bound to, uh, to expect that it might go a little bit over. We've got a nice bottle of whiskey and we're just sitting down and we're, we're having a chat about stocks. So, I mean, I think it's fair to say uh, in summary that most of us have probably expected your average run-of-the-mill recession to occur now, you know, for, for a while. However, none of us really saw it coming in the form of a pandemic hitting on multiple fronts like like this. I mean... The fallout is somewhat unknown right now and, and might be for a little, you know, might not be for a little while yet, I guess. Um, and although it's all good, me putting together a video listing these four stocks for you to watch, the most important thing you can do right now, in my opinion, is start buckling down on your own fun- fundamental position. Um, get that emergency fund together and make sure your personal finances are in line uh, before investing your hard-earned money. Um, you know, make sure you have a plan for every single trade or position you enter. I firmly believe that that is where true wealth is created and also it can be lost if you're not careful. Now, of course, I mean, when I say, you know, uh, emergency funds, it's an easy off the cuff statement that so many channels talk about. It's almost like the popular thing to say. Um, but I will give you a very a brief example. I personally had a goal of running off a three month emergency fund uh, about six, 12 months ago. Um, However, throughout this whole sort of pandemic, it has made me value my emergency fund even more. So, you know, I love buying stocks. I I wish I could buy stocks every day with an open checkbook. It would be amazing. But I realized that my emergency fund needed to be to be significantly more than what it was because three months just wasn't enough if, if it, we were to get a real recession or depression. So I decided to make my my emergency fund goal 12 months, um, which is probably on the more extreme end of emergency funds. Um, however, I'm lucky that it offset, offsets my mortgage. So now I've got my emergency fund up to seven months and the goal is to get it to 12. And, and that's how I'm happy to just sit here and not buy stocks right now. I mean, I, I do still buy my index funds every month, no matter what. Uh, I dollar cost average in index funds. It's, it's, a, it's a personal rule of mine. No matter what is happening, I just keep doing it uh, because I do believe that is how most of my personal wealth will be created over the next 30 years. Um, however, once again, guys, this is not advice. You should always speak with a professional before making investment decisions. Anyway, I appreciate all of you guys listening to my first episode here of Stocks on the Rocks. Um, This was a complete rant, had no real structure, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, And I promise I will clean these episodes up and have more of a plan moving forward. I have promised myself though that I am going to release this, uh, even though I'm not happy with it, it's going up. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, if you haven't already, feel free to check out the Compound and Everything YouTube channel. I put up two videos or one to two videos there every week. The next episode I put up, which will be episode two, is going to be more of a stock market news breakdown. We're going to talk about what's going on in that given in that given month and uh and try and break down what we think might be happening in the future anyway guys thanks again if you got all the way to the end i'm very impressed uh and cheers uh chat to you guys soon thank you